Good afternoon, University of Maine. My name is NC1 Veronica Scott, and I work at Navy Recruiting Command Headquarters. And we are here today as we are very excited. Um, I will soon introduce you to our amazing panel guest speakers here. And we are here to discuss breaking barriers, stronger together, and shared experiences throughout the United States Navy. So today's topic is Stronger Together, a look into careers and communities of female naval officers. Love this quote and would absolutely love to read it with you. I hope over the last 25 years, I've been able to change a few attitudes about women serving in the military through my actions and simple beliefs. My business isn't men or women, it is sailors. And that is by Command Master Chief, Anna Wood. Now, some of the roles that defines conventions. Gender stereotypes are overridden in the Navy by determination, proven capabilities, and a shared appreciation for adventure, adrenaline, and hard work. Today, women in America's Navy are trailblazers and leaders who excel in dozens of dynamic career fields, which we will, we will learn and discuss today. Some of our history makers breaking the ceiling with Admiral Michelle Howard. In 1999, she took command of the USS Rushmore, becoming the first African-American woman to command a ship in the US Navy. Admiral Howard is also the first female in the United States Navy for of, to be a four admirals star, excuse me, to be a, a four star admiral. We also have Lieutenant Commander Nikhil Shrill. After serving in the America's Navy as a helicopter pilot and a Russian policy officer, Lieutenant Commander became federal prosecutor. She presently serves in the US House of Representatives. And then of course we have Rear Admiral Gracie Hopper. As an American computer scientist and a pioneer of computer programming, Admiral Hopper launched the Navy into technology error. A guided missile destroyer, the USS Hopper, was named after her. Since the first female enlisted in the US Navy in 1917, women have been all over the Navy, have been defying expectations and proving that once was thought impossible, possible. Each of the women here today are speaking on their experiences in the service and how they became prominent leaders in their field. So now I'm excited to introduce you all to our guest speakers with Lieutenant Kadri, Nurse Corps, Lieutenant Q, Cryptological Warfare, Lieutenant Du, Informational Professional, and Lieutenant Shafino, Nuclear Surface Warfare. Let's get started. I will first introduce you to Lieutenant Kadri. She has a bachelor's degree of science from the University of Maine and is currently pursuing a registered nurse practitioner at the Duke University. She works as a charge nurse and clinical manager. Lieutenant, thank you for being here today. Great to be here. Yes. Awesome to be back at my alma mater here. So this is great. <laughs> yes, that's right. You are a class of, is it 2015? Yes, yes, I was. Wow, welcome back. Thanks, it's good to be back. <laughs> yes, and would you like to share, how has the Navy shaped um, your career? And um, how did you, what, how did you decide, what was the deciding factor to maybe come into the Navy or this career field? Um, so my deciding factor to, to join the Navy was in 2008, um, my brother who was a Marine at the time was actually injured in Afghanistan. And we spent, as a family, you know, five months being with him as he rehabbed at what was then um, Bethesda, which is now Walter Reed um, Medical Center. And when I was there, I was like, well, this is what I want to do. I was 16, and that made my decision for me. Um, and then I came on a lot of different college tours, um, UMaine being the best of them. Um, and I decided to come here and was picked up by the nurse candidate program. And um, I'll tell anyone who would listen that um, being a Navy nurse and coming to University of Maine were some of the best decisions I've made. So, for me. <laughs> and are you, you're currently serving as a reservist or? 
Yeah, I just tra transitioned from active duty to reserve um, just this last fall. So when you're not serving, which is one weekend a month or two times out of the year as, right. a, as a reservist, uh, what do you do outside of the Navy? Um, so I work two jobs. I am in school, like you said, um, to get my nurse practitioner degree from Duke. Um, and I like to be with my family. We love being outside with my kids, my, our dog. Um, we now live in Virginia Beach, which is great. We love the weather, so oh. happy to be there. You had a beach attached to that, and anything to me yeah. that has beach alongside that it sounds pretty nice. Yeah, so we like it. Ah, so um, throughout your experience uh, in the Navy, what kind of advice, if you look back on somebody maybe thinking about joining or they're attending college uh, and they're looking at maybe a nursing program, looking back at what you know now throughout your experiences, what kind of advice would you give someone? That's a good question. I would say to them, um, kind of see what you're interested in um, and, you know, kind of say yes to the, to the thing, as I would say pretty informally, um, you know, join the club, try, try anything, um, because really, truly, no matter what experience you choose, whether it be, you know, the school you decide on or the organization you decide to join, um, although the Navy is so much more than an organization, but you just the people you're going to meet and the experience you experiences you are given, um, whatever choice you make, really, you just got to make the most of it and you know say yes and take the opportunities when they come because sometimes they're really great and you don't know where they're going to lead you. So um, take the opportunity and see how it goes. That is so true. I love that advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And was there anything else that you wanted to add in regards to? Um, your career in the Navy? Um, I just met the best people, really and truly. I met people from all over the world, the country, um, and I'm sure my fellow panelists can act the same thing. Um, the best part of any journey is the, for me is the people that I get to meet. Um, in fact, my department head, when I was a clinic manager at Naval Hospital Bremerton in Washington State, was from Maine. <laughs> and um, it was just, we had a lot to talk about and you just really meet people and it's, they're the best part of the journey, at least they are for me, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could all agree, mm -hmm. yeah. And at this time, we'd love to take any questions. We could take about, for each of our panel guest uh, speakers, um, two to three questions if you have any questions. Yes. I was just curious, what kinds of things were you involved in at the University of Maine? Um, you mentioned taking opportunities and, and like joining clubs, for example. Were you involved in anything at the university that opened the door to the Navy? Yeah, um, so I was. Um, I'd already kind of had the Navy idea in my head when I started at the University of Maine, um, but um, I kind of took that to say yes to the thing as soon as I got to college. So I was the captain of the women's volleyball team here, which was <laughs> great. That was an awesome experience. I met some great girls doing um, a sport that I loved. I was an, a member of the University Volunteer Ambulance Corps, um, and that was a great opportunity. I got my EMT certification and worked as an EMT on the ambulance here on campus, um, as well as, you know, nursing school is quite a rigorous program, so there's a lot of homework involved, um, but, you know, I tried to do as much as I could, and um, it was a great four years when I was here. Nothing but really good memories and things to say about it, so. Thank you. Could you follow that up with any advice you might have for undergraduates, um, not necessarily just in nursing, but if they wanted to follow your path? And... Yeah, I would just say like get involved, you know, networking, meeting people, um, you know, people that I met that I worked in at UVAC, you know, ended up joining the military. Other, um, other nurses I went to school with here ended up you know, joining the army or, you know, joining the air force later on down the road. And, um, you know, they still reach back to me. They're like, Hey, I have someone that might be interested in Navy nursing, you know, is there anything you want to talk? And I, you know, I would encourage anyone, um, any nurse to kind of just like look at the military, um, medical careers, obviously I think the Navy is the best one, but, um, it was just, I got leadership opportunities, um, very young, like right out of, right out of college, um, that I really just feel like I was able to grow and, um, kind of hone my skills quickly and really develop into a leader at a young, kind of a young age, so. We'll start around the, the room over here. Good afternoon, ma'am. 
Um, okay. What challenges exist for transitioning from a military nursing career to a civilian nursing career, and how can how can we as uh, future officers make that bit easier for people? That's a great question. So, um, being a nurse in the Navy is wonderful. The population that we get to serve is really incredible. Um, I spent the majority of my time in the Navy working in pediatrics, which when you think of Navy nursing, you don't really automatically think of pediatrics, but that's where I was put and it really was a wonderful opportunity. Um, and then bridging to the civilian world was was very, you know, a, definitely a different animal, but I felt so well prepared um, really for any nursing or leadership opportunity that I could be given in the civilian world that, um, the transition for me wasn't too bad. Um, and obviously like having family support and stuff really helped. Um, but yeah, I really feel, I really felt well prepared because of my time in the Navy, both professionally and kind of personally. So, yeah. Good uh, question. Do you feel that your, uh, that being a reservist has helped that transition? Definitely. Um, you know, I was kind of sad leaving active duty, but I knew it was the right choice for, for me and for my family. Um, and being in the reserves was kind of the best of both worlds for me. I could really, you know, be a civilian when I, when I wanted to go to school, be there for my family, um, but still get to, you know, play Navy on weekends, like you said, and in two weeks a year. And I've, I've only been in the reserves five months and I've already been given some pretty cool opportunities. So I'm excited to see what the reserves has for me because um, I like that I get to do both now. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, you mentioned you came in through the nurse candidate program. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the nurse candidate program um, was fantastic. So essentially, when I was a sophomore at UMaine, um, I applied for the program. And it's a pretty rigorous um, application process, but it was, it was well worth it. And um, I was selected. And then you can be selected for a certain um, number of months of scholarship. Um, I was selected for the longest, I think it was a, at the time, and uh, Lieutenant Mance might have more information if anyone has questions, but for me, I got 24 months of school um, paid for. So basically for me, that means I didn't have to take out any more loans at that time, which was wonderful, because um, I was an out-of-state student at the time. I guess they've changed the rules for out-of-state students for UMaine, which is good. But um, so I got 24 months of scholarship here. And then as soon as I finished my degree program and passed my NCLEX exam, um, I went right to officer development school in Newport, Rhode Island, and then commissioned through there. What was your time commitment um, for paying back the Navy for that scholarship? So for the 24 months, I had to serve um, five years active duty and then three years um, what's called IIR, which is like inactive ready reserve. Um, I just decided I was gonna do active reserve because I wanted to do that. That was kind of my choice, but five years active and then that three years of IIRR. Thank you. Did five years go by pretty fast or? Flu. Yeah. It does, right? It really did. Um, so yeah, I can't believe that I'm already back here and getting to do really cool things. Like come back to my, the college I went to and talk to folks like you guys. This yeah. is awesome. It all comes back full circle. It really does. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences. And we'll also answer more questions um, after we're done with all of our other panel speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and transition to our next speaker, Lieutenant Tina Q. Works as a cryptological warfare officer and has helped led the Ship Signals Exploitation Space Program that guides decision-making for the tactical, operational, and strategic levels of warfare. She has also served as an operational security program manager, which helps train and educate sailors in the best practices of protecting sensitive and critical information. In 2015, she earned a Bachelor's of Science in Operations Search and is passionate about learning more about applied mathematics to help national defense and security. Thank you. Uh, hopping, hopping over the next and we'll come right back. So thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the University of Maine for hosting us here. So um, again, my name is Lieutenant Tina Q. I grew up in California and uh, for, uh, for my college, I attended the United States Naval Academy and graduated in 2015. I studied operations research, which is really uh, a subset of applied mathematics. And after the Academy, my first uh, tour, I served at the National Security Agency um, in the Computer Network Operations Office. So there I was 
uh, working, helping uh, the NSA with um, a certain mission set, as well as leading sailors who are um, working, also working at the NSA in the Computer Network Operations Office, uh, doing using our you know state of the art technology and using their skill sets um, to help uh, further the NSA mission and protect national security. After the NSA, I uh, served as a signals warfare officer on the USS San Diego. We came back from deployment in May 2021, and there I was leading sailors who did an amazing job at, um, at collecting technical data, intercepting signals um, in the interest of finding uh, threats around the world and, of course, finding um, possibly imminent threats to our ship throughout deployment. Um, and as I'm finishing my tour on USS San Diego, where I uh, met a lot of great people, learned a lot about you know, the ship side of things and seeing things on the other side of the coin, um, seeing data that feeds into the NSA, especially after having worked at, at the NSA myself. Um, I was really grateful for that experience and I look forward to serving uh, in my next tour at the Pentagon as I'm trans transitioning now. So thank you again for having me here and look forward to any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you, Lieutenant Q. Let's go ahead and start with any questions that anyone might have. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, what do you think the future of cryptological warfare will look like? And do you think the Navy will start using artificial intelligence in the near future? Great question. So um, as I mentioned, I did study applied math um, uh, in, for undergraduate. And I'm also currently working on my graduate degree in applied math. And the Navy and Department of Defense as a whole is uh, recognizing the utility of you know, applied math, machine learning, artificial intelligence, which is a very heavily statistics based. And that will help us um, develop weapons, smarter, more precise weapons, and also sort through data that the intelligence agencies are gathering so that we can be more efficient in you know, recognizing patterns and threats. So. I do hope, and I do think that that is the future of our um, of war fighting in this, you know, in the cyber domain and using information um, efficiently and how the Navy is, uh, you know, pr or providing more resources in that in that aspect is I do believe that the Navy has started opening up um, uh, something like a data science degree. Uh, through the Navy Community College program. If anyone knows more about that, please feel free to jump in. But I have heard about that, and I think that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for our sailors. The Navy also provides like education benefits for you know sailors who are especially looking for um, STEM degrees. So, the I think that the uh, more the Navy invests in our sailors and our education, the stronger we can become as a force in that aspect. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, for our students at the University of Maine, who may be interested in your field, and we don't have the operations research as a major, like what are other majors that you might suggest to those students or areas of study? So um, uh, applied math, statistics, and computer science, they are all, um, they, they, they're all looked very favorably upon in, um, in my community. I know my community looks for uh, you know, STEM degrees, people who are capable of understanding the technological rigor that you might encounter at the new, uh, National Security Agency. Um, while, while learning, um, you know, our, mm, while training to be proficient in our warfare areas, it is important that a student understands um, some aspects of physics, such as you know, uh, radio frequency spectrum and things like that. So things like that should not scare a student and someone who is um, comfortable in those areas would be great in this community, especially if, you know, I mean, it, it sounds cool, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just to jump in, um, basic eligibility requirements is STEM major. Um, they highly value Calc 1 and Calc 2 and a 3.0 uh, GPA in your major for in order to be able to apply. Um, like Lieutenant Hugh said, um, it is a very, it's a growing and evolving community, and the Navy is investing a lot of money into its growth. Um, so they're, they're in very high demand for cryptological warfare officers. Um, so 
if um, they have those basic eligibility requirements um, and you know some great letters of recommendations, involvement in um, school extracurriculars, organizations, clubs, um, they'll be a very good candidate for this program. Thank you, friend, that information. Okay, let's move on to our next guest. <clears throat> Lieutenant Kim Du has worked as an information, an information warfare officer and communications officer. She has worked in many places such as California and Japan, even deploying with SEAL Team 10 in Djibouti, Africa. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science Information Technology from the United States Naval Academy. She has attended Naval Post School and Mass Institution Technology for Professional Graduate Education. Lieutenant Du, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, thank you and Siwon for the kind introduction. Uh, much like the other panelists, um, I am so grateful to be here today to speak to you guys as well as those in the interwebs um, <laughs> dialing in whether live or afterwards. Um, please feel free to ask any, any and all questions. I think anyone here on this panel um, as well as in this room wearing a uniform will divulge um, any and all information to make sure you guys have the best information. Um, as NC1 stated, um, I've deployed um, pretty much in every coast, um, been all over the continents. Um, the Navy afforded me that opportunity that I don't think I would have been able to get really anywhere else um, in a professional career. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've met phenomenal people, both in and out of uniform. Um, there are thousands and thousands of folks that support what we do in the Department of Defense um, abroad and in the States. Um, uh, Similar to Lieutenant Q, I fall under uh, the information warfare umbrella. I'm what's called an information professional officer, specializing in network security, um, cyber defense, and communications. Um, all of those are facets that I've done my past five years. I was fortunate enough to study in that while in college, and I enjoyed it and decided to apply that over into my naval career. Um, and again, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to answer the questions. <coughs> Let's start with some questions. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, what do you think the future of information professional, the information professional community in the service and how will look like with uh, newer technology coming out like quantum computers? That's an excellent question. Um, I will answer the first one. Um, so very similar to cryptological warfare, there's a very big demand right now for information professionals in the Navy. Um, there's applicability pretty much in any area, any location. Um, as you've seen, I've deployed with SEAL Team 10. Um, I've been able to work on ships. Um, the community, not only in quantity is growing, but the quality of officers that they're looking for um, is immense. Um, the community itself, um, as a result, will I foresee that it will likely grow um, in numbers and in strength. Um, and with the amount of resources that are investing, I foresee the information professional community um, becoming even more elite than it is now in our knowledge base and capabilities. Um, to answer your second question about quantum computing, um, that will definitely the um, developments of quantum computing will change the scope, not only I think of the Navy and the DOD, but I think as a whole, right? Because now you're looking at being able to break the current encryption that we have in all of our networks, right? So people won't be able to bank normally or get their email normally with quantum computing. Um, and it'll just, it'll definitely leverage the way war fighting is done. Um, there's no doubt about that um, the international community, they're all very similar to nuclear power or competing to get an upper edge in how to develop quantum computing. So it'll definitely be interesting to see how the world um, develops into it. Um, I will say that the DOD has a big investment in that. And if folks are interested in it, um, there's definitely a place for you um, and whoever's interested in that field. Um, definitely um, very similar to what Lieutenant Q said, the DOD drives at the cutting edge um, in all of those facets. Thank you. Did mm -hmm. I answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Can I do have a question for you? Yes. What's the best piece of advice that you have been given um, by a leader, a mentor, someone throughout your career in the Navy? Um, actually, in um, 
very applicable to today's presentation um, with the Women's Symposium in this month. Um, I uh, had a phenomenal uh, department head mentor on my first tour. She was one of the first female IP officers um, while serving um, on board. She had, you know, really blazed the trail. And she sat me down one day and she said, um, you know, um, everything that we do in the Navy and really in the professional world boils down to one thing, which is really taking care of people and taking care of yourself, but mainly taking care of yourself first. Um, and that to me, as you know, as generic as it sounds, I mean, we hear it all the time on commercials, take care of yourself, take care of your families. Um, it really hit home um, in that time being, you know, in the middle of the ocean and being so isolated. Um, it was so comforting to hear that from someone. And, um, you know, she just said that, I mean, everything that we do, it just, it boils down to taking care of folks. And I think um, if you're someone that um, is compassionate, you do want to be around people, you do want to help in any regards, you know, um, you will succeed in life, regardless of, you know, if you join the Navy or not. So um, I think that's one piece of advice that's just, it's stuck with me through my career. So I appreciate that question. Yeah, for your thoughtful answer. Appreciate that. I have a question. Um, Lieutenant Doe, I do understand that you are transitioning into the civilian sector soon. Um, could you talk about a little bit about um, what the Navy, I guess what you've gotten in terms of resume building um, through the Navy that helped you set up for your next position and talk about a little bit how your um, career path has set you up to be a very good candidate for what you're about to do next? Yeah, excellent question. Um, one of the great things about being in the Navy is first of all, um, you know, just because you join, it does not mean you have to make this your entire life, right? Um, very similar to what, um, you know, our phenomenal nurse, of course, that, you know, um, it's it's not about, um, you know, really like shaping your life around the Navy. You really have to balance it out and find um, what works for you. While I was in the Navy, I was able to receive a lot of certifications in the IT world, you know, uh, certifications that would be thousands of dollars if I had paid out of pocket that the Navy covered for. They paid for education, books, um, you know, and, and I've already graduated, right? Um, I was able to attend MIT on the Navy's dime as well, too, uh, because they value that professional education. Um, and uh, now that I'm just shing out, um, it, it's, it looks very favorably um, with corporate companies. You know, they take a look, they know that besides your leadership skills, you also have you know, um, your certifications that match the civilian sector. Um, and that gives you an edge, you know, it definitely gave me an edge um, above other candidates that are applying um, with maybe the same amount of experience that I had in the uh, civilian world. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered your question. And what are you gonna do next? Uh, right now, um, I am starting an internship with Amazon in a few weeks here, um, working in their, uh, AWS uh, intelligence sector supporting, still supporting the mission, obviously uh, what we do, but um, just in, you know, not in uniform. <laughs> it's incredible for sure in that, Lieutenant Do. You know, uh, I think that a lot of times when people here join the military because of the benefits, and then people, a lot of times we're familiar with some of these benefits, right? Traveling, or medical, or, you know, if you want to continue at your education, that's taken care of and will help you pay for that. But there are also a lot of other things that many people don't know about, such as the certifications, such as, I mean, so much more coming into, right? Um, the friendships, the, the leadership, the mentorship that you take also that isn't always, isn't always shared. But thank you for mentioning that because there are so many other programs that are available for you and or your family down the line. Thank you, Lucendo. All right, and now we will move to our next guest, Lieutenant Isabella Shafino. Attended the U.S. Naval Academy and graduated in 2016 with a Bachelor's of Science in Economics. She served on the USS Wayne as an Operation Information Officer and Repair Officer. In 2019, after finishing nuclear power school, she was transferred to the USS Harry Truman, where she worked as Reactor Propulsion O2 Division Officer. Shapino now works as an officer recruiter with 
the Local Command Navy Talent Acquisition Group in New England. Lieutenant, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, NC Lynn, and thank you, University of Maine, for having me. Um, just a little background on myself. So I grew up in Lawton, Oklahoma. I was an Army brat, and I really didn't know anything about the Navy <laughs> in high school because there's <laughs> The Navy isn't really around Oklahoma. Um, so the Navy afforded me, I went to the Naval Academy, afforded me the opportunity to get out of Oklahoma, which I'm grateful for. Uh, <laughs> but it also got me closer to the water. And I, I hadn't seen a ship until um, I was at the Naval Academy during some of my uh, summer cruises. So it was really awesome. And uh, after I graduated, I went to San Diego as my first tour, which is awesome because a bunch of the Navy ports are around uh, great cities. So San Diego, um, Florida, um, Japan, you can go wherever there's water, there's uh, essentially a base somewhat nearby. Um, but I went there as a, a surface worker officer and I, um, at my, or once I got there initially, uh, you're immediately thrown into a uh, into the job. So the moment I walked on board, because I had to get my ship was out to sea when I first met them, I was boated on board. I was like 30 seconds later, I was already on the bridge. They brought me up there to, to take over conning officer and start learning. So I thought that was really cool. And immediately you're already a division officer when you get there. So you start leading sailors from the, the moment you get on board. Um, I met great sailors there. Um, and a part of, I was also part of engineering for a little bit, but mostly in the combat information center, I was working with operations specialists who, um, they manage surface contacts, they're even uh, control aircraft. So we have helos on board. They do, they're very diverse in what they do. Um, and the engineers are really hard workers. That was my first experience, very rewarding. Um, I did love my ship and I was deployed uh, twice while I was there for two years uh, to the Western Pacific and got to see a lot of places. Uh, most memorable places, Vietnam. We actually got to pull in there uh, during my birthday. So it was really awesome when we went out and spent way too much money on a place on that um, off the coast. And it was just like a, a crazy experience, but one that I will remember for a lifetime. Uh, after that, I went to nuclear uh, power school in Charleston, South Carolina, um, and started the first leg of that training. I didn't know I wanted to be a nuke at the academy until I, I just tried for the position later on, just on a whim, because I, I wanted to be, I was thinking about Marine Corps, wanted to be a surface warfare officer, but I decided why not try for nuclear. It's a, a more elite community uh, within the Navy and it's uh, very competitive. So I tried for it and fortunately I, I made it through. Um, the power school is, a, is six months and then prototype is uh, the actual uh, training on a training reactor uh, down in Charleston or, or New York. And then I went off to the Harry S. Truman where I did my uh, division officer tour and qualified there and operated. There's two uh, reactor plants on board, very large, um, but we we did very complex like evolutions, you, uh, different from maintenance availabilities in a shipyard. And then also when you're steaming, uh, we support missions for launching catapults with steam and then also turning the propellers to uh, propel us forward. But yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Yes. I have a question for you. Um, I do understand that the nuclear power program has um, some great scholarships. Um, could you talk about that um, for people who aren't at the Naval Academy um, and are interested in pursuing a career um, in this specific community? Yes. Um, so now I'm an officer recruiter in Boston, but we cover this area and I'm recruiting for the NUPOC program, which is probably the Navy's best kept secret because I didn't meet anyone until nuke school that did NUPOC. But Basically, you uh, can apply as early as your sophomore year and you're a full-time student. Uh, the only thing you need to do is a, a PRT, a fitness test. Um, now it's once a year until you graduate. Um, for certain positions, there's sign-on bonuses. So $15,000 sign-on bonus for surface warfare officer nuclear, what I did, and then also submarine officer. Depending on your GPA, there's instructor positions. So the people who actually teach us down in Charleston, they are um, they're Navy officers down there. Um, that's about a 3.4 GPA. It, 
And then there's also Naval Reactors Engineer positions. That's officers in DC that work at Naval Reactors, which is uh, the Navy's nuclear program headquarters. Um, you get E6 pay if you do the program, which is in Boston, it comes out to about $5,000 per month while you attend school. So over $100,000 before you can get out uh, and graduate and then go to either officer candidate school or officer development school. So you get a lot of money, um, well compensated, and then also your crew leave, which uh, when I went down to Charleston, I met people that had a bunch of leave. I'm like, how do you have 60 days of leave? Like, I had to take leave my whole tour, but, but you accrue leave, and then um, you also get to um, access health care because you're um, technically active duty enlisted. But you, the only thing that's required is you to be a full time student, maintain your grades, make sure you're not failing, and then um, just do that physical readiness test once a year. And can you talk about what kind of majors um, you, you look for for this specific program? So uh, any STEM major, um, you just have to meet the requirement of calculus one and two and physics one and two. That's the basic requirement. You don't have to have any uh, nuclear engineering experience at all. You will learn everything in Charleston. Um, the application process is a little bit different than if you were to uh, go for a surface word processor or uh, information professional cryptologic worker because there's interviews in DC. So at the end of the application process, you actually interview at Naval Reactors, two technical interviews, and then you actually meet Admiral Caldwell, who's the head of Naval Reactors, and they offer you the job that day. I love how when you were sharing your experiences and you mentioned that you went to Vietnam on your birthday mm -hmm. and spent way too much money <laughs> on it. because it really is about, you know, throughout our experiences in the Navy and sometimes it's, it's something that you're going to remember mm -hmm. the people that you serve with, the, the job that you're doing, that'll never, I mean, that's priceless, mm -hmm. right? So I love that because I can picture you enjoying <laughs> your time out there. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, then, ma'am. <clears throat> what challenges exist for integration into the SWAT if there's local community? Um, I'd say uh, from the beginning, it's you're not uh, in the nuclear pipeline just yet. So two years is is learning how to be a surface worker, also getting your pin. Um, transitioning to nuclear is, I'd say, the only challenge. Maybe you haven't gone to school. Uh, for two years, learning like calculus physics or, or just doing that like, kind of coursework. Um, it's a it's a totally a different animal when you go through the nuclear pipeline and you just have to learn, uh, trust the process. I think one of the craziest things I learned is uh, you have to brief a lot of things. And sometimes they tell you day of that you're supposed to brief a startup or a shutdown in front of everybody. and You're not ready, but you have to do it. So you just kind of get used to knowing like how to do a startup and a shutdown and being able to tell everyone and brief it on the spot. So just having confidence in what you do, um, you learn how to do it. Because a bunch of, even at the start of your interviews, it's oral, it's an oral presentation. And throughout the new community, they continue this process. So even uh, qualifying that prototype, it's an oral, uh, it's an oral board is what we call it. And then going onto your ship, you're still presenting the same information and, and knowledge. So it's a, it's a good skill to have. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm curious, and when you reflect back to your time when you were on a ship, mm -hmm. what do you remember as being the best part of being on a ship and the most challenging part of being on a ship? Um, hmm. Uh, sleeping on a ship might be the best part. Uh, I don't know. Does, I don't know if that's a good answer, but it really is true. If you have a hard time sleeping, like being on a, a smaller ship, definitely like um, you just it rocks you to sleep. So you get quality sleep. You might not get enough sleep, but. I um, also enjoyed uh, being on a smaller ship, the camaraderie. Like I knew all, all every, pretty much everyone on board. It's about 300 people. So you just get to really know everyone and build a, a really good team. Um, the worst part is 
Uh, um, maybe if you're into physical like fitness, sometimes it, there's not a lot of space on a ship. So not being able to, and it might be too rocky that day. Um, running on the treadmill is definitely different on a ship, like <laughs> going up and down and not trying to, it's a, it's a different experience, but sometimes you don't have all those like creature comforts as well, like the food that you want to eat. It's, uh, but those are trivial things at times, but I, I like to be on the ship and underway. You get to focus on yourself and really meet people and and work on qualifications and, and hone in those skills. Like our, our job is underway. So it's it's hard to do those things in port. You're not really able to test some of those skills like in port because our job is out to sea. That's a good question. Any other questions? What would you describe or how would you describe um, what has been a primary support for you as women in the Navy? Um, in terms of personnel support or morale amongst each other or any established groups that you're all parts of. Well, could you speak to that? We could start um, here and then work our way down. Sure. So I think the best support um, when I during my time in the Navy was like other women in the Navy, honestly. And being part of this panel, I feel very like, oh my gosh, these people have done really incredible things. Um, obviously my family and I would say other women in the Navy, like I, I spoke on yesterday, um, when I started in 2015 in the Navy, my entire chain of command was, was men, which didn't bother me. It was just, that's what it was. When I left the Navy in Washington, my entire chain of command was women. So even in that short time, I even saw a, a really large shift um, in the Navy. You know, It was a really big deal in 2015 when a woman was a CEO of a ship. And now I feel like we have a lot of female CEOs on ships. So, but they can probably speak more to that, but it was just kind of a cool shift that I got to see during my active duty time. Absolutely, I'm gonna echo. Women in the Navy are some of the best females you'll meet. You know, when we think about do it all, like women in the Navy do it all, you know, we're moms, we're wives, um, but we're also fully dedicated to the mission. And I don't think I've met any women outside. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, obviously, you know, all females, we're all challenged in our own regards, but female in the military, especially the Navy, are just a little bit of a higher caliber. They care. They genuinely, you know, do want to do things the right way. Um, they have so much integrity, so much courage, um, and I just see them focusing um, so much on their personal lives, giving all to their families as well as their jobs, um, and that, and it just being surrounded by those women, you know, you might not even get to know them, but just reading about their accomplishments, you know, becoming the first CEOs, breaking barriers, that in itself is phenomenal mentorship. Um, and it's phenomenal to see, um, you know, yourself also grow into those, those roles that women paid before. Um, so I'll just echo on that. And I'll just, just mention that if you're a female and looking to go into an environment um, where you want to be welcomed, right? Females in the Navy, and honestly, um, you know, I've seen a lot of transition with acceptance of female roles, right? I, I work with SEALs, you know, arguably probably one of the most male dominated um, environments you could be in period in the world. And, um, you know, the acceptance and the regards of what we do and what we're challenged to do every day, um, I see it and they accept it. And, you know, they want to push us up. And I don't think I, I can get that really in any other organization. You know, so I've been blessed and, um, you know, uh, as females, you should never worry about having to, uh, you know, uh, have any sort of obstacles. I've never seen in the Navy. Um, and if anything, I think women in the Navy are super powerful. We can overcome pretty much anything, hit our way. So, yeah, yeah they hoo ya for that. It's any cute. So, uh, I will say the, the female Navy officer support within, um, within the Navy, within this community is really, it's amazing, it's astounding. So um, when you think about it, females have been uh, able to serve in the military for just a little over 40 years now, some, somewhere between 40 and 50 years. And uh, I think we're really thankful and grateful to be reaping the benefits of those who were willing to blaze that trail and those who were willing to, um, or who were able to learn from um, mistakes and roadblocks and uh, and who are willing to um, 
guide and mentor those who are coming after them so that they don't have to face the same you know challenges um in a way and that has really led uh to our i think exponential success in the military because you know, there are people who were willing to reach out seek mentorship from those who have come before them and those are who and then those same people who are willing to uh as pay it forward and uh, do the same for those for those coming in after them so the support is amazing i've also been very fortunate throughout uh, my time to have um been in under the friendship and and guidance of of male male officers and friends who are open-minded and are not um and, and are welcome i have been so uh blessed to have experienced that that was the majority of my experience yeah, it's hard to, <laughs> to follow up with um <laughs> the good navy is is only about 25 percent female still so we're definitely trying to up those numbers but on my first ship i didn't have a male um or i didn't have a female department head i had all males so it's a little bit different um because you kind of don't uh think about it until later um until I went to my carrier, my whole, all my principal assistants above me um, and they were supervisors were male. Um, it does. So it's once I was leaving, um, we had a bunch of female and junior officers and that was great to see, um, to just be able to uh, learn from each other and hopefully the, they continue on in the Navy. Um, when I left, uh, I had two female principal assistants, and that definitely changed the dynamic in in the office of principal assistants, just having females present. Um, so we're trying to recruit and get more females in the Navy because it, it's a good environment. Yeah, and speaking on the resources for uh, support of that type in the Navy, I know that um, there are plenty of Facebook groups for you know officers, chiefs. Uh, senior enlisted, junior enlisted. I, I've seen those uh, Facebook groups and they are a, a great resource. There are also um, email lists that are active and there are you know, frequently um, like women's leadership symposiums that are advertised as well. So there, there is a lot of formal support within the Navy, support like support, uh, actually supported by, by the Navy, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, that answers your question. That's a great question, but that's, you know, from the experiences um, and what we've seen over the years in the Navy, breaking the barriers, right? We we heard about our four-star Admiral, Admiral Howard, uh, a lot of the incredible women that have served in the Navy, you know, that have been the first. But Navy is also big on mentorship. We have mentorship programs and some of the also, you know, other social media groups that, um, Lieutenant Q had mentioned as well. Now, I have to tell you that, and let me go back to the quote by Master Chief Wood, and I'll read it again. I hope over the last 25 years, I've been able to change a few attitudes about women serving in the military through my actions and simple beliefs. My business isn't men or women, it's sailors. And most of the time when you're serving in the Navy, we say, I wanna say 100% of the times, we know things can be situational. It's really a sailor. We're not thinking of that's a male, that's a female, you know, sailor, it's it's sailor. So thank you for the question. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your insights. And do we have do we could take a one or two more questions? Uh Daphne ladies, question for the whole panel. What changes do you feel would increase your tension within your community? <laughs> so uh, I believe that if Navy invested um Oh, the Navy does invest a lot into other sailors, right? And uh, I, re I really think that's the key for Navy to continue doing that, especially uh, in programs that allow uh, sailors to um, take care of their families. And sometimes, or a lot of times that can be a challenge. And for sailors to have opportunities and access to education, I think that, uh, I think those two things would be, uh, would be huge. Did anyone else on the panel want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, the the biggest thing, um, and I go back to kind of what my mentor uh, alluded to, is taking care of folks. And the Navy's done a phenomenal job. Even 
in the short five years I've been and I've seen transition changes in programs on national level, you know, we have Congress um, and you know presidents that are willing to step in and, and make huge sweeping changes for veterans and active duty folks too. Um, you know, because I understand that if they invest into us and to our families, right, um, they're gonna build a force and an organization that uh, continues to topple other countries. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll give very, try to give a specific example, but I know, you know, the maternity leave program changed for females, you know, unparalleled, um, I would say for what I've seen in the corporate sector um, for, you know, when as a female, when you can start planning out and that's helped retention. I've had females that have been able to pivot their careers to continue to stay in simply because of the maternity, you know, programs um, and the leave that you got paid leave, right? Um, so that's just one example, but I've seen the retention just dramatically change, right? Um, the culture of the Navy is phenomenal. It's changed as well too. And it's always been great, but I think the Navy is, and military as a whole is realizing um, if they capitalize um, on all of these facets and take care of folks, right? Um, I, I can say for a fact um, that I knew whatever problem that I had in my personal life, um, there was no, there was always at least 10 or 15 resources and personnel supporting me along the way that I could reach out to um, with no judgment while I was still active duty. And as I go into the reserves, that will help me. Um, and that, that speaks volumes, you know, you don't hear about that in you know, a day-to-day -day civilization, right? So just to kind of tag on to what Lieutenant King was alluding to. Thank you. Yeah. We have another question. Well, for all of our viewers that are online, thank you for joining us. If you are watching the replay on this and you have any questions, we'll make sure to leave a point of contact so that your questions can be answered. Um, so I want to thank you all that have joined us here in person. You online can't see this, but we are squeezing over like 100 people in this, in this location. So uh, thank you for being here. And don't forget to stop by and grab some Treats, we have treats. We call it Navy swag as well at this table for you for being here. And our guest speakers, thank you so much for being here. If you don't know, not familiar with this, um, we're, we have traveled from different locations to be here with, with you today. Um, and they have to share their experiences with you. We are very excited that we had this opportunity to be here with you all today and, and to share that information as well. And this is why we are stronger together. Thank you for joining us and we wish you a great day.